Good morning and welcome to Rock Chapel. My name is Casey Finn and I'm the pastor here and I just want to welcome you to our worship service and I want to thank you for joining with us when you've got the the option to worship with what millions or at least thousands and thousands of different congregations and yet you have chosen to worship with us this morning. I am so thankful that you're here with us. We are going to, as we have for the past several weeks, try to have as normal of a service as we can, being that we're all uh, stuck at home and having to gather virtually. We'll have songs and we'll put the lyrics to those up. I want to encourage you to join in with singing. Um, worship is a vital part of, uh, should be a vital part of our lives. And this gives us a great opportunity to practice that. Uh, also, there will be a time of prayer. I want to encourage you um, to pray along with us. Uh, don't, don't pass up the opportunity to spend some time in, uh, in prayer with God. We'll also have a time of giving as well as a time of reading and discussing and reflecting on God's Word. So once again, I'm just thankful that you're here with us and I'm looking forward to our time together this morning. God bless you and let's worship. Let's sing, What a Mighty God We Serve. Have you seen His wondrous works this week? I know I have in many ways, and I'm thankful for that this morning. Let's sing.
Lamentations 3 verses 21 to 26. This I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion, therefore I will wait for him. The Lord is good to those whose hope is in Him, to the one who seeks Him. It is good to wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. Great is Thy faithfulness, O God my Father. There is no shadow of turning with Thee. Thou changest not, thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever wilt be. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness, morning by morning, new I see all I have needed thy hand hath provided great is thy faithfulness Lord unto me of sorrow looking up from the valley of fear you can see doubt off in the distance and you're about to lose heart right here but don't ever give in don't ever give up God is with you and you'll overcome can't make it over it will try to convince you that it's way too high though you feel defeated know that God keeps his promise so you tell the mountain just how big your God is
just try to remember all the trials he's brought you through and when his power gave you strength for the journey the very hour you needed it too so don't be discouraged cause time after time God's never failed you go on and climb the mountain will tell you that you can't make it over it will try to convince you that it's way too high though you feel defeated know that god keeps his promise so you tell the mountain just how big your god is though you feel defeated know that god keeps his promise so you tell the mountain just how big your god is so you tell the mountain just how big your god is just how big your god is This week, as I was preparing um, to talk to you this morning, um, I came to this passage in Luke, Luke 24. I actually preached it last year around the same time, around Easter time, because this is probably one of the most famous passages about Jesus' resurrection um, in, the, in, in all the Gospels, and a very well-known story. And I, I want us to look at it... Um, this morning because I think it can maybe reveal a different facet of what we're going through and, and help us help give us some encouragement as we press on and as we persevere. Uh, the passage comes from Luke chapter 24 and uh, it begins with verse 13. I'm going to read it for you and then, uh, then we're, we'll just talk about it for a few moments. He says, and behold, two of them, talking about two disciples, Two of them were going that very day to a village named Emmaus, which was about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all these things which had taken place. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself approached and began traveling with them, but their eyes were prevented from recognizing him. And he said to them, What are these words that you're exchanging with one another as you're walking? And they stood still, looking sad. One of them, named Cleopas, answered and said to him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem and unaware of the things which have happened here in these days? And he said to them, What things? And they said to him, The things about Jesus, the Nazarene, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word, in the sight of God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to the sentence of death and crucified him. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, it is the third day since these things happened. But also some women among us amazed us when they were at the tomb early in the morning and did not find his body. They came, saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just exactly as the women also had said, but him they did not see. And he said to them, O foolish men, the slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer those things and to enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses, and with all the prophets, he explained to them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. And they approached the village where they were going, and he acted as though he were going farther. But they urged him, saying, Stay with us, for it is getting toward evening, and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he had reclined at the table with them, he took the bread and blessed it, and breaking it, he began giving it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. He vanished from their sight, and they said to one another, Were not our hearts burning within us while he was speaking to us on the road, while he was explaining the scriptures to us? 
And they got up that very hour, returned to Jerusalem, and found gathered together the eleven and those who were with them, saying, The Lord has really risen and has appeared to Simon. They began to relate their experience on the road and how he was recognized by them in the breaking of the bread. As we read this story, you really have to set the stage and imagine for a moment that Jesus, this one that you'd been following, this one that you'd pinned all your hopes on, after all they said, uh, what were the words they used? Um, the things about Jesus and Nazarene, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word, in the sight of God and all the people, how the chief priests um, and our rulers delivered him to the sentence of death, crucified him, but we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. They had pinned all their hopes on Jesus. And then they had watched as he was crucified. And what a blow to their hopes and their expectations and their dreams. And yet Sunday morning comes and these women go and they find the tomb empty and uh, Peter and, and uh, John go and, and look in the tomb and find that the tomb is empty just as the, the women have found. And yet these are just rumors at this point um, because after all, it's only women that have seen the tomb, you know, seen Jesus. And, um, you know, Peter and, and they hadn't actually seen him in the flesh. And so here are these two disciples, Cleopas and the other disciple. They hadn't heard about, you know, anybody reliable had actually seen Jesus. They'd just seen an empty tomb. And so who knows what might or might not have happened. And this put them in kind of a state of, of confusion and of worry and, and of fear. And yet uh, sort of a, a hopeful, optimistic fear um, you know, it sounds like maybe they think there's a possibility something good could happen, but at the same time, uh, there is the concern that maybe it, it won't. Maybe, maybe this isn't necessarily good news. That there's, they just don't know what to believe. There's rumors, and, and at the same time, they know what they've seen, and, and they just don't know what to believe. And as I was reading through this story and thinking about it, I thought, my, oh my, can't we relate to these disciples on the road to Emmaus? Can't we as we find ourselves facing the situation that we're facing, uh, can't we relate to having a great deal of optimism and then all of a sudden something happens and it's like, what in the world is going on? I mean, I, I remember before 2020 started, all the churches and, and organizations and everyone else, they, they were putting out all of these these things, how 2020, I mean, it just lends itself too easily. 2020 was going to be the year of vision, that we were going to have 2020 vision, and we were going to see, and we're going to be able to go forward, and we were going to move, and there was going to be progress. And it's like all of that thinking, we're going to have 2020 vision. God says, oh, really? And we were reminded, practically before the year even got started, that we have no idea what lies ahead. We don't even know what's going to happen tomorrow, much less for the next year or longer. And sure, I mean, we can get our vision of what we hope to see, but ultimately, it's like the proverb says, you know, we can make plans, but God's the ultimate one who, who directs the steps, who lines everything out. So here we are in this situation where I think a lot of us, I know for me, and probably a lot of you, you, you looked forward to 2020 and thought, okay, you know, God, what are you going to do? You may be excited about what was going to happen and where God was going to take us. And um, and yet we, we get it barely into the year and it's like we hit a brick wall. And this bad thing happens. And, and you know, imagine being one of these disciples. It probably felt similar. I mean, you're moving along. It looks like Jesus is really, um, he's doing some awesome things. You're seeing him work and and then all of a sudden he dies, and you're thinking, what, what's just happened? And that's where we find ourselves in sort of this period of, of what's going on around us. And like these two disciples who they heard rumors, they, they you know, heard that maybe this was true, or you know, maybe Jesus had been raised from the dead, but, but at the same time, you know, maybe somebody had stolen his body. I mean, we've heard that, that his body was missing, but it doesn't sound like they had actually been there and seen it for themselves. It was just something that they had heard. And don't we find ourselves in the same situation? That we turn on the news and you hear one thing, you hear rumors about this, and you get on Facebook or you talk to friends and family, and maybe you hear something else, you hear rumors of that, and, 
and this person saying this, and that person saying that, and this person saying that they've got you know the inside information about such and such, and this person over here is saying they've got the inside information. They're saying the exact opposite, and we hear uh, both sides, and we're thinking, oh, I just don't know what to believe. That's where these two disciples were. They just didn't know what to believe, and they were getting caught up in all of the rumors and in 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 all of the. The, the, the conversation and in all of the local gossip and in, in all of the, the hopes, you know, they said we hoped that he would be this and, and they're looking at all of this and then they come face to face with Jesus himself and they don't even recognize him. And I wonder, as I was reading this, I wonder, might Jesus be trying to walk right alongside of us, trying to talk to us and we don't even see him because we are so caught up in the conversation and so caught up in the rumors and so caught up in the latest gossip and so caught up in what we had hoped was going to happen that we have lost complete sight of Jesus. Meanwhile, he is right here walking alongside of us and it's like we're just talking you know, running our mouths and talking, 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 maybe even talking to him and don't even realize that he's the one that's standing right next to us. I think that maybe, I, I know for me, I can't speak for you and I can't speak for anybody else, but I know for me, when every all of this started, it was a tremendous temptation for me. And, and I found myself getting so caught up in, in just all of what everyone was saying, listening to this person and listening to that person and look at, listening to this person over here and trying to piece everything together and saying, what, what is, what's true? <laughs> you know, what's real? I, I don't want to hear what your opinion is or what your opinion is. I just want to know what's true. And I, I found myself getting so caught up that I, I was like these two disciples on the road to Emmaus and just listening to these different voices, these different rumors, and, and not knowing what to believe. And over the past couple of weeks, God has been speaking, and he's been speaking exactly what he spoke to me in this passage, that what we need is not to spend more time listening to the latest rumors and gossip and conversation, what we need is not to get focused on what this person thinks or that person thinks. What we, what we don't need to get focused on is what we hoped would have happened. What we need is the same thing that Jesus gave these two disciples. He comes to them and he says, he says to them, what are these words that you're exchanging with one another as you're walking? <laughs> I, I, I kind of wonder if maybe Jesus would ask us that question if he heard us as we talk to each other about all of the things going on around us. Or if he saw us as we, you know, typed out our, our posts on Facebook. I, I imagine him standing next to us as we, as we talk and as we type and him saying to us, what are these words that you're exchanging with one another as you're walking, as you're talking, as you're typing? And we say, are you the only one who hasn't heard about everything that's going on around us? And Jesus says, what? I, I love this because it really does give us some insight into who God is and into what God is doing. I mean, Jesus, they, they bring this up. Oh, are you the only person who doesn't know what's going on? And he's the only person who actually does know what's going on. And yet he says, what things? Because he wants them, I think, he wants them to think through things for themselves. He wants them to, to stop the talking and to really think about it, to think about what's going on instead of just rushing on and letting our lips lead rather than letting our, our minds and our, our spirits lead. He says, what things? He's the only one who does know. And then they say, oh, the things about Jesus, you know, he was a prophet. See, they don't, even, they don't even know. They don't even know what's going on. Jesus wasn't just a prophet, but this is what they're saying. He was a prophet who was mighty in word and in deed in the sight of God and all the people and how the, the chief priests and our rulers, they delivered him over to be crucified. And we were hoping that he'd be the one uh, to deliver Israel, to redeem Israel. He is. But again, they don't even know. Indeed, besides all this, it's the third day and, and some women from among us, they amazed us and they were at the tomb early in the morning. They, they didn't find his body and they came. They said they saw angels, a vision of angels, said that he was alive. 
And some of us, you know, we went and we, we looked, the people looked. And um, they found it just like the women had said, but they didn't see him. That's the where, where they leave it. But they didn't see him. And so there is this hint of, of disappointment, like, well, you know, this is what these women are saying, but, but we know we've not been able to prove it. See, they, they think they know what's going on. They've been talking about what's going on, you know. They, they think they've got it all down. They know what's happening. And yet, yet the reality is they don't. They, they've got no idea. And neither do you and neither do I. As we look at what's going on around us, we don't have 2020 vision. And I don't care how much you think that you know exactly what's happening, you don't, and neither do I. Because we just don't. God knows, God knows, and he's in complete control. But you and I, we don't know. We don't know. We may have a lot of ideas, we may have a lot of suspicions, we may have a lot of you know things that we're trying to put together, but the reality is we don't really know. And the sooner we admit that, the better off we are. See, the two disciples here, they thought they knew. They didn't know. They didn't know. And Jesus then, he continues talking to them. And he rebukes them. He says, O foolish men, slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer those things, to enter into his glory? And then he begins with Moses and with all the prophets, and he explains to them the things concerning himself and all the scriptures. Jesus gives them an education. And he gives them an education using his word. And he begins to lay it all out for them. He goes back to the very beginning. That's what he means whenever he says that he began with Moses. Because traditionally Moses is the, has been attributed, um, or he's the author of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteron Deuteronomy, the first five books of the Bible. And so he begins at the very beginning. I, I just imagine Jesus as he's making his way with the disciples, and he just is like, okay, let's just go back to the beginning. Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And he started to explain how everything since the very beginning had been leading to exactly what was happening. And they were getting caught up in the rumors and in the gossip and in everything that was going on, everything they thought, every, uh, the hopes they thought that they had and now they don't. And the fact that, well, we heard maybe he, that he, his body was missing and that he was alive, but we haven't seen the body. They start going through this. Jesus brings them from the very beginning and says, look, this is exactly what had to happen. Why? Because God is in control. Because God is sovereign. Because God knows what he's doing. Because God does not make mistakes. Because even when it looks like everything is spiraling out of control, like it does for you right now, disciples on the road to Emmaus, God is still in control. And everything that had to happen with regard to Jesus' death and resurrection, it had to happen. That God was the one that was in control of that, not you and, and not the Romans and not the, the Jewish leaders. No, God was the one who was in control. And he begins to explain everything from the scriptures, from the, the Old Testament, what we call the Old Testament. And they have this wonderful, you know, Sunday school class as they're making their way down. And as, I, as I've been thinking about this, I thought, you know, this is what we need. What we need, because, because our, problem is, our problem is that we, we get so easily out of focus. We lose sight of Jesus so easily. We lose sight of God's hand, of his control, so very easily. And we start to think, well, you know, what about this situation? And what about that situation? And, and what about this? And what about a sickness? And what about my rights? And what about the economy? And, and what about, you know, dying? And what about, yeah, I mean, just on and on, all of it. And we lose sight of Jesus because we're so worried about all of this other stuff. And I think that if we could just come and sit at his feet or walk with him in the way and listen to him, he would let us know, he would reassure us and he would let us know he is still in control. He's still in control. And all of the worrying that we do and all of the discussing that we do and all of the, the sharing that we do it doesn't do a whole lot of good. It doesn't do us good. It doesn't really do anybody any good. What we really need is to sit at the feet of Jesus and listen to him. And if there's anything that I have been learning over the past couple of weeks, it's that. It's that I need to spend more time listening to his word than I do listening to anything else. Jesus explains this to them 
right? He, he goes through the scriptures. He explains how he, you know, God's been in control. He's been orchestrating all the events from the very beginning, from Genesis 1-1. God has been in control. He's been taking care of things. And even when people threw wrenches into the plans, it never got God, you know, never messed God up because he, he had always had the contingencies needed to make sure that everything was right on track and right on time. Now, after they get there and after Jesus reveals himself, it says in the breaking of the bread, they say to each other, Jesus disappears, right? They realize who Jesus is and then he disappears from their sight. And we read in verse 32, they said to one another, were not our hearts burning within us while he was speaking to us on the road, while he was explaining the scriptures to us? As I read that, the question that comes to my mind is, when was the last time that reading the scriptures made your hearts burn? When was the last time that you opened God's word and you began to read and hear God's word, hear him explain his heart and his will and his desire, and you were overwhelmed with his presence because his word was communicating his presence to you? When was the last time that you turned off all of the noise and got alone and just you and God and truly experienced God's presence in a way that made your heart burn within you as these disciples on the road to Emmaus experienced. See, I think sometimes we get so caught up in all of the worries and in all the, the what-ifs and all the, the, the bad news and everything that's going on around us that we totally lose sight of what God is doing and of who he is. I know several years ago, I, I was dealing with a lot of anxiety and a lot of worry and some fear. And I remember I was in Louisiana at the time. I was preaching um, at a revival. And I was in the, a house uh, one, one of the nights. And there were two other ministers who were there with me. And, and we began, you know, I shared with them just some of the worries that had been on my heart and on my mind. And they prayed for me. And then they went to bed. And I, and I sat there in the, the dining room just thinking and experiencing these worries. And I got the, the, the thought came to me that I should write my worries out. And so I got a piece of paper and I got a pen and I began to write down the worries that I was experiencing and that I had been feeling. And one of them was, you know, I was afraid of, um, of death, not only for myself, but I was feeling this, you know, what's going to happen to my family if something happens to me? What's going to happen to my wife and my children if something happens to me? And I, I had this concern about being left alone and I went through, I, I made this long list of all the things that had just sort of been plaguing me. All of the worries that I had. And then I began to read them. And every single one of those worries, as I read it, there was a scripture that came to mind that counteracted that worry. And so I remember reading that, that line where I said, um, you know, that I was just, uh, there, there was this sort of fear of death that was just sort of hovering around the surface, around the corners of my life. And immediately, as I was reading that, that fear, um, God gave me uh, from John's gospel, where Jesus is, is coming to Lazarus. Lazar Lazarus has died, and he meets Martha on the way. And Martha says, Lord, if you'd have been here, my brother wouldn't have died. And Jesus says, Martha, Lazarus is going to rise again. And she says, I know that he'll rise again in the resurrection. And Jesus responds, I am the resurrection and the life. He, believe, he who believes in me will never die. And I read that fear of death and then I wrote that scripture out next to it. I am the resurrection and the life. I, I remember reading that, that, that uh, worry about what would happen to my family and um, how would they be taken care of? And the scripture immediately came to mind where I think it's in, in Peter, in First or Second Peter, where Peter writes and he says, cast all your cares on him because he cares for you. And I, I wrote that scripture next to it. And I remember seeing that, that verse where, it, you know, that, that sort of fear uh, uh, rather of, of being alone, of being abandoned. And, and the verse immediately came to my mind, I will never leave you or forsake you. And I wrote it down. By the end of my time there, I had written down verses for every one of those fears and those worries. And I was overwhelmed because it was a moment like these disciples on the road to Emmaus. 
I had all these worries and all of these concerns and all of these rumors and, and things that were going on in my mind. And I was thinking, what if, and what if, and what if, and, and, and it's like Jesus just sat down at the table with me and said, all right, Casey, I want you to, I want you to tell me what you're worried about. And I told him, I mean, I, I laid it all out for him. And then with each one of those, he just spoke to me and said, listen, this is what my word says. This is what I've promised you. This is what I've promised you. And so if you'll, you'll hold on to this promise, then you don't have to worry about this. And it was an overwhelming moment for me. And I feel like that's what a lot of us need right now. We need to put down all of the, 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 the garbage, all the garbage. I, I feel like, I want to ask you something, and I, and I want you to answer it seriously. And, and if you're with somebody right now, even if you're with somebody, I would encourage you to answer it. Um, I would encourage you to answer it out loud. Um, and the question is this. The question is, have you, have you drawn closer to God since this happened? Have you, have you been in his word more? Because here, here's the thing that I've experienced, and maybe your experience is different from mine, it very well may be. Um, I think for most of us, we probably have more free time now than we had uh, two months ago. We probably had more free time. Even for those that are still working just as much, maybe even more. Um, you know, two months ago, we had ball games to go to. We had school events to attend. We had all kinds of stuff that were filling our lives. And now we don't. So even if... Even if you're still working, even if you're maybe even working a little more than normal, there's a good chance you probably have a little more free time than you had than you had before. At least as much. I don't think there's anybody, or there's probably not very many people who have less free time now than they had two months ago. There may be some of you out there. If you do, if you are, if you're in that boat, then you can go ahead and turn turn off the TV or the the computer. But for most of us, I think we're probably in, in the boat of having a little more free time. And my question is, has, has your, your scripture reading and your time spent with God and your prayer life, has it grown in proportion to the free time that you have? And that is not a necessarily a question that, that we want to answer. I mean, even myself. Um, I know for me, and, and partially it's been because of what we've been doing, um, uh, with with going through James and going through Colossians, I have been able to spend more time in God's Word since this started than I have in a very, very, very long time. And for that, I am so thankful. Um, I have so enjoyed the time that I've gotten to spend with God. Um, but it's been because I have made myself. Because it would be really easy right now, with all the worries and everything else, for me to just sit back and, and relax and fill my mind, watch TV, or, you know, play a, a game, or watch the news, or browse Facebook 24 hours a day. It would be easy for me to do any of those things. I could let my mind just totally, you know, go veg out. Um, but God has been so faithful to keep me in His Word, and to bring me back again and again to His Word, and keep me thinking about Him, and who He is, and what He's doing. And I just, I really want to encourage you I think that's the only way that we're going to get through this better than, than how we entered in, is if we draw really close to God. If we don't, if we just, you know, go with the flow, and we continue to fill our minds with just whatever happens to come along, and we're not intentional about filling our minds with those things that are good and pure and lovely and true and of, good, you know, of a good reputation, if we're not intentional about meditating in His Word and dwelling in His presence and spending time in prayer and seeking His face, and, I mean, right now, for many of us that, are, that maybe don't have as much going on, this is the perfect time to spend some time memorizing Scripture. You know, it's the perfect time to study study a book of the Bible like you haven't before, to read like you haven't before. Let's If, if we do that, I, I don't think we'll be disappointed. I think that if we do that, by the end of this, we will have grown in our faith, we'll be closer to God than we've been maybe ever in our lives. And I just feel like, and I, and I, I believe this wholeheartedly, that God has allowed this to happen for a reason. And the reason is not for us to waste it on whatever that we would naturally waste it on. I think he wants to do a work in us. He wants to change us, transform us, and draw us closer to him. And I want to encourage you um, this morning to draw near to him. To let it be a renewed drawing near to him. Jesus went to the cross 
He suffered and died for your sins and for my sins so that we could be redeemed and brought into the presence and the family of God so that we could live forever, so we could overcome fear and overcome death and overcome every sickness. That's the hope we have in Christ. And if you've never, if you have never responded to that hope, if you've never given him your faith, if you've never turned away from your own way, your own selfish desires, your own sins, if you've never repented and come to him, then I want to encourage you to put your faith in Jesus. He is the only thing that will get you through not only this, but every sickness that comes your way and through death itself. He is the only thing. And if you have been following him for a long time, and if you've been a believer, I want to encourage you to don't let this time, however long it lasts or doesn't last, don't let it pass by and have, have grown not an inch in your spiritual walk. That is the most important thing. And we have been given an opportunity if we would but take it. The only question we have is, will we take it? Will we respond? Will we come like the disciples on the road to Emmaus? Will we come and will we listen to Jesus? Listen to him explain. Listen to him reveal himself who he is. Will we come and will we listen? Or will we just keep talking about the latest and the what's going on and, and what we hoped and... Um, you know, all of the, the, the dashed expectations and the rumors about, you know, is his body there or is it not? Will we do all of that or will we just spend some time sitting at his feet, listening for his voice and allowing him to reveal himself in ever greater ways? It's my hope that that is what we will do over the next however long. Until then, may God continue to grow us in faith, in hope, and in love. I'm so thankful that you have gathered with us this morning and worshiped alongside us. And like I said a minute ago, I just, I feel like we have a tremendous opportunity right before us um, to draw closer to God than we have ever been before. I don't believe, I, I was telling somebody earlier this week, I don't believe that our world will ever be quite like it was before all of this happened. I think that this is one of the uh, biggest uh, events and, and uh, catalysts for change um, that our generation, uh, those that are living today, has ever seen, um, and I hope that it uh, will ever see. Um, I think there's major changes, but I'm not d discouraged by that. I believe that God can lead us places that we have never gone before. I think that he can do things in the midst of this and through this and after this that we've never seen before. And, um, 
And I firmly believe that God is at work in all of this. So I'm not discouraged. I'm really encouraged because I think if we stay as close to him as possible, he will not only lead us through this, he will lead us into the place where we need to be, where he has been planning for us to be from the very beginning. So don't be discouraged. Um, I think that we have a tremendous future ahead of us, and I am highly encouraged by God and by his work and by his provision and by his care. Um, a couple of announcements that I want to share with you before we go. Uh, at 3 o'clock today, we will have our Zoom meeting. Um, we won't necessarily be going through uh, Andrew Murray's book. If there's anything from it that you want to discuss, you're more than welcome. You know, you, we can. But we uh, really want to take an opportunity more to share prayer requests and to have an opportunity to pray. And so that's what we did last week. And um, I really, really enjoyed it. And I hope that you'll join us for that. That'll just be a time of prayer. Um, at Tonight at 6 o'clock, we will we'll be continuing our study through the book of James, which we'll be doing tonight, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday at 6 o'clock. If there's any questions that anybody has or topics that you'd like to cover, anything like that, please send me a message, uh, comment, uh, let me know. And we will um, we'll get that, we'll cover that sometime in the next week or so. Um, as we've been doing on Wednesday night at 7 o'clock, we will be having our uh, class, Theology for Dummies, and we're going to continue looking at the names of God. That's what we started looking at this last week. So we looked at what, uh, what God's names are, you know, what names are used of God and what those uh, reveal about who God is. So that's what we'll be doing on Wednesday. If you know of anyone who's in need or has a, um, if you've got a prayer request, if you've got anything going on that you need help with, uh, please give me a call, let me know, and we will uh, we'll do what we can. As of right now, we still don't know how long this is going to last. We know that the governor has um, issued a stay-at-home order until May the 8th. Uh, beyond that, if they do this three-stage plan, three-phase plan, I don't know. I mean, we, we just don't know. We will take, um, we will do things as they come. And, uh, Hopefully we will be, uh, well, we'll just see. And, and hopefully we will get together as soon as we possibly can. We love you. We appreciate you. We're looking forward to seeing you soon. God bless you. And uh, hopefully we'll see you tonight at 6.